So I also wanted to ask, um, really to open up the idea of, of digital art, what can it offer that really is beyond the scope of, of what we would think of as the, the traditional fine arts? So what are the really exciting things that are being looked at in digital art now? It's a great question because um, when I, I worked on my, my, my first book, The History of Development of Digital Art, which is this one, uh, it was published in 2005. And uh, it was an opportunity for me to really look back into technology and art and starting from the you know, 1950s, 70s, and the, all the way to now digital. And, uh, and I, a lot of questions came to my mind because the most amazing the characteristics that separate digital art from traditional art media are actually not matching with what the whole, uh, if I would say, fine art system is built upon. For example, I call the I, I, I in the book I talked about how digital art is more like liquid. One of the great advantage of it is it could through a connection and flow into anybody's device, and so it has an amazing ability to spread wider and farther out than, for example, a a piece of a, a painting or a sculpture or architecture, which is even worse because it's fixed in, in a particular physical location. But that characteristic is unique and different, mm -hmm. but at the same time, make it challenging um, for the art community to, to see it. And the other thing would be the, the fact that it can be duplicated easily. Actually, digital files are, would, the, the whole format of zero and one was designed to be duplicated, multiple times, and never lose. But that is totally against the whole mechanism of our market, which is based on the unique uh, one of a kind, the precious object. And uh, so all those are great characteristics of this media, which make it a, a questionable thing. So that's why when I wrote the digital aesthetic books, I put a big question mark there, mm -hmm. because a lot of these are we willing and ready to accept it. And uh, so that's um, the first few of those questions that comes into my mind when I actually look at what the differences are between the digital and the traditional. Right. And I, I actually, um... So I guess full disclosure, um, I, I met you two actually at FIT, and I was able to see an exhibition of some of the student works, and they were really wonderful because they were interactive. So these were particularly posters that, and you had an app with your phone, and once you looked at the app on your phone, the posters moved, and also played music, which was just brilliant to me. Um, so I've been really impressed with the way in which a lot of these projects um, work with winter interaction. So how the, the objects or images really interact with the user. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, you, how do you think, what are some of the ways that digital works interact differently with users than say analog works? Well, take, yeah. I, I mean, just to uh, also mention a couple other exhibitions at FIT. I mean, there was the one that you saw, Callie, and of course there's that interaction, but um, there's, there's also a way of taking traditional works, paintings, and making them liquid in terms of allowing for other content to be attached to a painting, whether it's like immersive technology where yes. you might see even an older painting and learn how it's been conserved or um, before CJ's show that had a lot of interactive components to it that you, you know, download in an app and you put your phone up against a poster and it played music and it moved and it told you more about the student or the authors of a particular piece. Uh, we had some sculpture, sculpture students plan or create a sculpture that you experienced in VR. So the whole VR component, which is new, and after CJ's show, we had a show called The Future is Immersive, where you experienced a lot of the content or even something that might be 
traditional, this, these two students made a figurative work in, that you experienced in VR, but there was an actual chair in the exhibition space, but you put on the VR headset and you sat in the chair and then you saw a figurative sculpture. So there's lots of ways to play with ideas of maybe traditional work that is digital, where CJ is talking about being a digital artist, digital content, digital creation or creativity, but also by using VR or apps, so there are a lot of ways that students are using, you know, VR or other digital technology is sort of second nature. Yes, uh, I agree with that because the audiences today, especially the younger generation, they're um, they're very used to interact with digital media. And it becomes like not digital art. It's becomes a way that they interact with the, cre the creative process is a digital one. Mm -hmm. And it becomes an added component or extra way of showing extra content. And, um, you know, it's the way that they're thinking that, you know, traditional sculpture students making figurative work via VR, which is super interesting. Yeah, and I think that particular product, the exhibition you're talking about, the future is immersive. I was really impressed by the project because I, I forgot the name of the project, but uh, it was a bunch of students recreate the New York City, right, and then provide that uh, uh, the media content to kids that's in the hospital. They they are not able to physically visit New York. And uh, they see New York through these artists' eyes and recreate a VR virtual experience for them to experience the city. I think that's a great example of uh, taking advantage of what digital media can offer. Right. And, uh, and that kind of interaction is, uh, I thought, I think conceptually and technically pretty Yeah, amazing. so you could experience, you could actually see physical work, you could experience it in VR, and then kids at Montefiore Hospital for this show called The Future is Immersive were able to experience parts of the exhibition or whole parts of New York created in paintings through a VR headset so they don't have to leave you know their hospital so this way of like bringing exhibition or bringing art via VR technology to another population that's not visiting the gallery and we showed a whole process of how that was made. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, I think VR and AR is definitely a really interesting area a lot of artists are exploring right now. And another one I would say is uh, unique to digital art is big data. And there are a lot of big data visualization, take the take advantage of the computer's capability of quickly and in real time gather this data and then use that as a driver to transform our work. I think that would be pretty difficult to do in the more traditional format or, or using traditional media. And I think that's what makes it, um, there are areas like that that's very exciting. Absolutely. I mean, ways of understanding data and information seems, you know, da digital ways absolutely to show data mm -hmm. and to use that, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was also gonna ask, what do you think uh, are, are the reactions from some people? What have you heard about, or what has surprised you about audiences when they are confronted by some of the, these things, some of these digital projects? I think the audience is almost ahead of artists in terms of you know, most people have their computer and they're communicating and, you know, relating, even sending emotion via the computer, which is um, something that, you know, was predicted years ago. I think for us, particularly our exhibition space is right in, you know, in the middle of New York City on 27th and 7th, and it's open, you know, every day of the week from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. so that you have people coming off of the bus or the subway right into our space and they're able to immediate, it seems like immediately interact with an artwork that it, it doesn't have to be a specialized audience. We have people coming off the street and students, et cetera, um, experiencing your work or that, you know, take a piece home. We also do this uh, art piece called Chalk where um, students draw on the building 
And this year was the first year it had an AI component that, you know, sort of work that is on the sidewalk that you can put your phone on and, you know, the piece changes and you can learn who did it. And mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of digital art that, you know, CJ has been working in this field for a long time and is well versed in it, but there's a lot of it going on in our exhibition space in all different ways mm -hmm. in sort of throughout illustration and fine art and digital technology and, um, you know, graphic design. And it seems like there's a lot of different parts of the college that are using digital aspects to more traditional work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And uh, also for some of my exhibitions uh, that I curated, part of my goal is to actually challenge the, the user in a sense, because digital technology penetrates our everyday life in almost every aspect uh, these days. But it is always um, being used in a very practical uh, as a very practical thing. And even when it comes to design, it's being seen as a tool like Photoshop that you have to learn to use it correctly. Mm -hmm. And then so you you read the manual, learn how to do it, and it's through case study. And I think that part of the job or obligation as an artist or a curator is to challenge and change people's view on certain things. So for exhibitions like Data In and Data Out that I curated a while ago, we're, we're talking about looking at the digital technology from a different perspective, almost like break it, break open the black box. Mm -hmm. So you're you're not like putting it on a pedestal and worshiping it because I pay so much money for this computer, I'm not willing to touch it. <laughs> I just want to learn how to use it. And I think the source of creativity is that willingness to not be afraid. What if I take it apart, put it wrong, uh, put it back the wrong way, and then. It, and so what? And see what comes out of it. And I like that attitude. So one category of art, you know, digital art that I put in one of my book is called hacker's art. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of mentality is to hack it, to take something that we've seen so normal, a telephone, a cell phone. What if I turn a cell phone into a, a, a Digital piano. <laughs> yeah, so that kind of artist I enjoy a lot. And uh, that kind of artist I'd like to to make a mixed statement in a different way. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, CJ is the perfect artist and curator that he challenges an audience and students to, you know, like fix spurts. You know, he's one of these experts that's digital and he's fixing things. Like he took, did this whole workshop with students that really uh, you could look at as an exhibition because they use post-it notes and drawings, but they were solving, you know, digital related problems or posing solutions. And maybe you can talk about that a little bit, that in addition to showing painting and things might be on a video or extra content where we might be reading less, but we're listening more. He also had students actually take sort of online problems or digital components of artwork and expand it. And mm -hmm. I just let CJ sort of do what he does <laughs> and, you know, give him the space to do it. And that maybe for as a curator or somebody managing an exhibition space, you know, I am interested in that audience and those authors and having them kind of expand and do giving them the space to do all these things mm -hmm. yeah actually what you you just said giving the artist uh, or student the space to explore not be afraid uh, to make make a mess i think that's uh, that's critical right in, in my opinion and uh, that's what i was um, so interested in this hacker art uh, concept like one of the early um, uh, internet or net art artists, uh, Jody, uh, the collaboration, so Jody, the husband and wife collaborations. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that really inspired me because when they, uh, that's early day of the web page. Instead of really using code to create a web page, they try to expose what's underneath the page. 
So when we talk about digital aesthetics, I think that's the kind of things that really stimulate and try to uh, help you think differently instead of using digital just a different way to produce uh, a, a, a physical catalog electronically. So I think that's what I promote in my class as well. I teach um, classes like um, uh, Intro to Web Design. The first few assignment of mine is always asking them to experiment, to make a mess of the code, and learn through those mistakes. I always tell them you learn much more through making mistakes than doing it right. Because a lot of times when you do it right, you're just following my step one, two, three, and you're not really understanding how these pieces are to put together. So um, that's uh, to me, that's my philosophy as a teacher, and that's what I try to uh, encourage uh, through my practicing different ways. And we can think of the digital space as an additional space, like there's the gallery space or the artist studio or the classroom or, you know, an exhibition space when we do some of the things that CJ's been doing and other artists like it makes me think of, you know, iBeam is about to celebrate their 20th anniversary and that's a, you know, been a digital um, experimenter space. They're a nonprofit art space. And, you know, it becomes this additional space that artworks or artists or students or audience can participate. Mm -hmm. Well, are, are we in that realm right now? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I find, I tend to find really interesting um, as you might imagine from, from what I mentioned about seeing the one exhibition at FIT, is the idea of agency. Um, I mean, a person can walk into a museum and they're always, you know, that's their choice, but the idea that you can just turn an artwork on sometimes, or the artwork responds to you, I find that to be a very exciting sort of threshold. And it's something that I can't really experience with, you know, say, Renaissance paintings and sculptures. They have different ways of trying to make you feel like you have agency, but it feels much more active a lot of the times. Have you, have you found that? I mean, I think that's a really important issue, that idea of agency. It seems like um, that's what curators are talking about and artists are talking about maybe in different aspects, what agency means, but absolutely, I mean, at FIT, I mentioned that, you know, chalk drawing mm -hmm. project that we do in the fall that you have to come see um, that you can put your phone to and the artwork interacts with you. Um, but also, you know, people and curators and museums are taking Renaissance paintings and, you know, making them have a certain agency by adding, you know, like there's that Van Gogh uh, traveling exhibition where they have, you know, you can experience Van Gogh's bedroom via VR. Um, and I think, you know, there are certain ideas where artists or audience can change an artwork or add to it. Um, and I, I think agency is absolutely, um, you know, a, this idea that you can create something right away or experiencing it right away or more of an audience. Um, I, I think that idea of agency and in the digital realm is, you know, what is super important or just, it, it seems like it's definitely, um, you know, people are talking about that. Yeah, that's actually a, a great question that I thought about when, uh, Austin, you, you're talking and um, discussing that. And and I, I started to look back at when did I start making interactive artwork? It was actually, I started utilizing uh, traditional media like oil painting to reference digital art around 1998, 1999. So I had one uh, serial of work called Liquid Mondrian. So what I did was I took Mondrian's work I translate it into HTML code, and then re, I then take out the canvas that's the exact same size, and then I paint the code on that canvas, and then frame it exactly the same way. And the whole concept is Mondrian's work. Now with this piece and this piece right now, they are exactly the same, but uh, because the count, the only difference is content is now being represented as code. And uh, so I'm, I, I guess in my own mind, I'm questioning uh, because I was moving from traditional to, to digital. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. So I created that series of work and I got invited to show in the Queens Museum. And the space they gave me is this space called Art Space and uh, uh, is sponsored by a toy company. And the requirement is uh, any work that's, uh, that's being shown in this space has to have an interactive component, an educational component, so the kids can play with it. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, but these are paintings. What, what should I do? And then I, based on the concept of this piece, uh, Liquid Mondrian, and created an interactive in interface, I call our interface, it's called my data equal my Mondrian. So what you can do, any participant is, you just basically is a form, like uh, like a, a unlike dating uh, website form. Basically, you put in your age, your gender, your eye color, your hair color, your weight. Once you put that all in, and the algorithm that I written is going to translate into a Mondrian esque composition, and then you can print it out. And then you can take one home. I, I, I set it out so you can print out two copies. One you put on the wall in the space, and then you one you can take home. So they so when you enter the space, you see all these print uh, print out of Mondrian is composition. Every single one is individual. That's awesome. And people love that. Right. And starting from that point, I started to create a lot of these art interfaces. That's the base of my equal series. So I always find a modernist artist translate the concept into algorithm so allow people through a very everyday activity like filling up a form or, or creating an avatar and they create something that connect to a, a, a part of important art history mm -hmm. so that uh, i worked on that series about seven or eight years it was a great a really amazing experience because you see people approach your work play with it and that excitement that comes to their face and they, they're, they're calling their friend, so try this out. Right. And that is actually a great experience. Yeah. That's wonderful. It sounds like there are a lot of pseudo Mondrians out there. <laughs> <laughs> I'd kind of like one now for my office, but um, perhaps not yet. So actually, um, I was also wondering what kind of challenges did you face? I mean, already when we're dealing with basic software at the office or when we're dealing with code and coding errors that we have all these frustrations what what have you really what kind of hurdles have you really have to had to um, overcome in working with with digital art on the more practical front i think austin and i hope oh, and everybody who has curated exhibition that has the uh, technology related or were probably experience the same things just like how we start this meeting right <laughs> technical issues that's always of course, a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the the expensive machineries and uh, they were not designed to be always on but right. for an exhibition you have to be tweaked in the same way and or lighting issues because a lot of these light uh, pieces needs a very controlled environment I think that's um, that everybody understand, and we all have experience in um, with it in our own way. And my challenge these days is to think about things like VR. When we put a VR piece in a art exhibition, what does that mean? Because unlike the traditional artwork or some other digital artwork that is very immediate, you walk into the space, you see the big painting, or you see the big output digital output of some kind or light doesn't matter and you you get that impact right away and multiple people can experience that at the same time but for example vr is a very isolated experience you have to put on a headgear and you are having fun walking in that space what it's happening to other people that's around just standing there watching you wearing this headgear and don't know what's going on right. ar the same thing it's all very segmented and isolated experience. So my challenge for me as a, uh, as a curator right now is how do I create a more commonly shared experience uh, uh, for digital And how media? do you think you're doing that? If I have an answer for it, I won't be asking the question <laughs> I mean, myself. Like what, which, yeah. I, I mean, I like the idea of like mixing things up. I agree. Like. Um, you know, this isolating experience of putting on VR. I saw a picture recently of people sitting around a table and they each had a VR headset on. 
and they're experiencing something that's not relatable to each other in the circle, but just it's a, you know, individualistic experience. But I'm curious, um, you know, how is digital, how, I mean, like in an exhibition that CJ curated that we had at FIT, there was traditional artwork sort of mixed in with more digital, digital or more liquid. I like that idea. More liquid work, and it didn't wasn't segregated into its own, you know, room that was dark or you know had a specialized place. It was all sort of together. And I'm curious, like moving forward, museums are so concerned about audience or people coming or how they stay relevant or you know how agency is um, experienced in the museum or the college gallery particularly mm -hmm. you know what ways are there mm -hmm. that we um, we have three spaces at FIT a lobby a gallery and this like workshop room and that can allow for different ways of experience and work or different ways that students can make work or um, you know, different aspects of, you know, an exhibition, but, you know, moving forward, like what are the best ways for, um, you know, for digital work to be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't have an answer for, for that, but uh, that's why it I mean, is you've very done challenging a lot of posters and posters with graphics yeah. and mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, we'll, we'll continue to search. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I remember um, I I was in an exhibition in in Erlangen in Germany. That's where Siemens is from, so they have a lot of um, interesting stuff going on. But I remember speaking of a VR, a virtual reality. There was this one place where they would make you go into a room. They'd give you a headset and gloves, and you actually had to kind of walk a little bit. But it was probably the most awkward experience. Uh, it's a very small room, and there was there was someone there to make sure you didn't hurt yourself by tripping over wires and by hitting the wall because you were supposed to move through this experience. So that that sort of disillusionment between reality and virtual reality was kind of a a dangerous liminal space, if that makes sense. So even the idea of um, of movement throughout this sort of gallery space became very different because you can't quite tell what the person experiencing this is going to do. Um, mm. So I thought it was very funny that you could have this sort of, like, as I said, awkwardness that you wouldn't have in any other experience because you're just not sure how to transition, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it totally does. And uh, last summer I went to Italy and there is this uh, technology experimentation and um, and the startup funding uh, place called H Farm and had, they have this beautiful uh, VR lab so one of my our student that put on the headgear and then he's experiencing it all of a sudden he jumped and uh, his head hit the rail and then we realize why there's a rail there because the, uh, the VR experience is so real. He was trying to jump off the building in the VR, and then his physical body jumped, and then the yeah, space doesn't yeah, allow him to do that. So he hit his head right on the That's rail. Dangerous it is very space. dangerous because yeah. you lost it, it when it becomes successful, it's so real, mm -hmm. and you didn't realize the, you, the, the separation between physical and, and the, the virtual disappeared. And I bet that will happen more that you know, that separation between real and digital or, that, you know, that dangerous yeah. liminal space that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think wires are a our problem. You know, we yeah. every in our exhibition where you experience things, we did it a couple different ways. One, we just like put out the headset and people, we had people figure it out themselves. And one, we always had an attendant. So, okay. Um, and they both worked, you know, letting people figure it out with the controls and then one with um, an attendant. You can do it a couple different ways, but, you know, that having, you know, a student hit their head. Yeah, um, it's scary. Yeah, that's that's yeah. bad art. That's not good. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's worth considering, you know, these kinds of weird issues that come up, including wires and including how people move. Because even physically, I think for anyone who played with a Nintendo game controller, 
you know, if you're playing something that's moving, you're constantly moving it around, and your body is actually trying to control things that it can't necessarily control. So right. it's actually, yeah, it's very funny how, how that can kind of play with your, your brain. Right. Yeah. Um, so what do you think you're going to see more of in the future in terms of digital art that's being exhibited? I think there's definitely room for more discussion about uh, the digital landscape. You know, artists who are doing video, but also thinking about, um, I was just reading an article this morning about, you know, how that is being perceived in a museum or on a screen or how many screens on your phone, everybody has phones. Uh, I think there's a lot of room for discussion, you know, in terms of what works, what doesn't work, and still that transformative experience for an audience to participate in something or experiencing something. There's sort of the idea of participation and experience, mm -hmm. and then the making. Yeah, and the, what I see is, uh, which concerns me a little bit, is in order to take the experience of the artwork out of the black box or the limits of headsets or what what, what else you have or uh, the, yeah you need to actually build a environment the totally digital environment with sensors with multiple projectors and then totally controlled sound environment which is possible which a lot of artists are doing right. but only that's only can be produced for like huge art festivals, right. art electronic art or something like right. that. Or even like Pipilati wrist and an immersive. Yes. So a lot of artists, unless you are at that level or right. get, get the opportunity, you won't be able to do it. Doesn't matter with how talented you are, doesn't matter how hard you work, when you don't have the resources and funding, you just don't have resources and funding. Right. So the the space will keep become, in my opinion, because of this limitation, it becomes less and less diverse. And uh, one time I was like, you know, I was young. I was complaining about oh, uh, being an artist and this and that. And uh, a friend of mine who was a wise person. And then he said, well, you, sh you should consider yourself lucky. I said, why? He said, well, I'm, uh, I study uh, acting. If there's no production, I cannot act. Mm -hmm. I simply just can. He said, you can still sit in your studio. You can still make the work. You may not be able to get to big expression, but in any way, you can draw, you can paint. And uh, so I was like, oh, wow, that's right. And I, I get a sense that digital art is going that direction. Uh, you had to have that kind of support in order for you to create a work that at that scale that's really truly experiential, and I think that will limit the type of di uh, and diversity that's in uh, in digital art. Well, do you know of any like are there grants out there specifically for digital art that you know of? Specific for digital art, I'm uh, here. I'm not. Um, I'm not as familiar. I do know in Taiwan there are some. But uh, still, not uh, not a lot. And I think our work or artists need to live on grant itself is um, is, is is unfortunate. I, uh, right. you need to have a better system to support. So in Taiwan, what happened is then you know what kind of work is going to get funded. And uh, who has the name that wants to submit it will get funded. And so it becomes a little bit of um, uh, domination. So, and then writing of uh, resourcing now, fair way. And have you had success in, in saying, getting funding for new exhibitions that are, you know, exciting new digital art? You know, we're very resourceful at FIT. Um, and we were even thinking about like continuing this discussion about you know, current digital art trends or, you know, is there a digital aesthetic? We thought we might continue this as a workshop at FIT. Oh. Um, and that's a way of being very resourceful, like posing a question and then having artists, students, alumni, uh, guests, artists 
contribute to that answering of that question. And that's the way we're sort of posing exhibitions in our space is that we think of a theme and then we have people sort of apply or address that theme. So we were even thinking about maybe, you know, in February, we might take this idea of, is there a digital aesthetic and um, apply it across the campus. So have like, you know, we, of course, Fashion Institute of Technology, we have a big, you know, fashion is in our DNA. And how does that apply to the fashion industry? Um, how does it apply to other besides just like photography, sculpture, or painting? You know, there is a lot of ways this kind of can address it itself. So um, we really try to be resourceful in that we ask questions and then we sort through or curate those answers. Um, but yeah, we, we do a lot with a little, right? We, um, you know, we use things that D CJ has a lot of TVs and we use those. <laughs> We're constantly borrowing things from CJ that because he is an innovator uh, in this realm and he's got He's got technology. Yeah, the, some of the equipment I had was uh, also the support from FIT and some of the industry partners. So we, uh, I don't think I ever got. Adobe. Yes, I never got like huge funding just to create the exhibition, but I did. Uh, I think I consider myself fortunate to have the opportunity for seven years or so. We get uh, sponsorship from the FIT Student Association. I have a club called Media Design Club, and we get about twenty thousand dollars of funding to create a large-scale media art exhibition. Oh, and cool. because of that, uh, had, we had that C funding. Then we can go out. We talk to Hewlett Packer. We can talk to whoever um, the industry people who can uh, chime in and help us. And so we did some fun and exciting stuff. Like one year is all about repurposing. And uh, so students create our work that use the concept repurpose mm -hmm. to create things and uh, change people's perspective. For example, one group that do 15 different way of creating QR code. So kind of like break apart, like what, why, why, what, which part do you have to break in order to uh, make the QR code not work? Mm -hmm. So they create like shadow QR code, they create QR code out of nails, they create QR code out of pizza, which got <laughs> out of the opening good. line. So uh, yes, yeah, so we did get some uh, support, uh, generous support to help us did some of these uh, great things. And I, I believe that's what we'll continue to do going forward. Well, yeah, I've been getting a lot of questions about funding just from the academic museum community, but I feel like there are a lot of different groups that you could probably get together, um, including the New Media Caucus, um, Digital Art Historians. Uh, so there, there are actually a lot of groups that I think would be really interested um, if you do, you know, pursue this this kind of discussion further. Um, I think that would be really exciting. That'd be great. Um, so I, I just have one more question, and that is actually kind of coming from an issue that's been around for a long time, which is conservation. Um, do, you see, do you see a good future in conservation for digital projects? Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Right. I mean, sure, yeah. From left on our way over here, we saw like a trash can full of zip drives, like old mm -hmm. discs, and my, you know, my. Uh, one of my assistants in installation at the exhibition space, you know, he's in his 20s. He was like, wow, what is this? <laughs> and so it's definitely, um, yeah, you know, sort of a realm that can be problematic. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I def and there's an amazing professor at FIT uh, she works in animation and computer graphics, and she created these beautiful printouts in, you know, the early 90s. And those printers don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the software that she created, really these paintings that are just absolutely beautiful. She has to recreate them through the four by five transparency. So even sort of looking at something that broke apart a digital um, technology that was 
you know, at the time the current, you know, that was being used to recreate something. She's having a really hard time. Um, you know, it's sort of backwards in terms of like scanning a four by five transparency of something that was created on a computer with a software that doesn't exist and a printer that doesn't exist. So it it is seems sort of there's an ephemeral quality to digital work. I agree. Um, I actually think the classic or traditional art media are great technology because they were designed to last for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And none of these digital things that we're talking about was designed to do that. Right. Um, computer language changes all the time. And that's still a little easier because you can transcode it. Right. So software art, you can transcode it and make it last a little longer, but there's no guarantee. And uh, But software art is very difficult uh, when it comes to collection and because it's, what is it? Because it doesn't have a physical component to it. So a lot of artists uh, started making limited edition that has physical components to it. So it has, um, has software plus hardware, but none of these hardware stuff were built to last more than five years, to be honest with you. Right. So these things are gonna break down for my own work. And I would sell, for example, a, a device with the software pre-installed, but at the same time, I give a a a, a disk uh, actually contain the software just in case if that breaks down, they can buy uh, the device to to replace the software itself. So there are things that artists trying to do to make it a little easier to maintain, upkeep, and um, cons for conservation purposes. But uh, I. Sorry to sound like a bad news <laughs> there, but I, I see this as a losing battle. Yeah, I mean, it's it seems like something worth considering. I mean, this is like, this happens throughout history. Oxford built a forest so that they could rebuild some of their buildings. Um, so maybe artists need to consider sort of the future of their medium and try and get, get ahead of it when they actually do create digital art. So, yeah, I agree. Interesting. Agree. So, um... It's actually going on about an hour, so I think I'm actually going to stop our discussion, but I would love to speak with you again, and I would love to get more resources to put on the website related to some of the things that we were talking about, including some of the exhibitions, uh, both at FIT and that you have had um, artworks in. I think that would be wonderful. Great. Great. Yeah. Okay, well... Everyone have a good afternoon. If any questions come up, feel free to email me and I will relay them to CJ in Austin. Great. Um, and again, this recording will be available online in a couple of days. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.